Thank you, Dr. Orge and Miss Ann, for your hospitality. It is a joy, honor, and privilege to stand before you today. And I just got to say as well, I'm so grateful for Dr. Wilson and Miss Susan for your ministry to Kelsey and I over these last few years as well. I've, I've learned a lot in my time through Gateway. Um, they've said that the books that you read and the people that you meet in the next five years will radically change your life, and that's certainly been true of Kelsey and I's life. Not only have we read great books like Impact Preaching that sincerely has helped me tremendously, but also these men that I've mentioned already and many, many more. I think of Dr. Kelly and the list could go on. So I'd encourage you students, not only read the books and give yourself to them wholly, but spend time with your professors. Get to know their likes and interests. Journey with them through your time here together. It'll be life transformation. It will be life transforming for you. I know that. You'll get to find things out like they're Oakland A's fans, that they're Oregon Ducks fans. And to protect, now it's college football season, that's, that's good and well, but protect the guilty in the room. You will even find that there are some who are Nacho Libre fans. Oh, you know the iconic film, don't you? There's been several occasions I've been to this brother's home, and every time he said, you want to watch Nacho Libre? We have watched it no less than five times. I've counted, Dr. Orge. You, do you know the iconic film? It is a Catholic friar. Let me just entertain you for a moment. It's a Catholic friar who desires to be a champion in wrestling. But there's a problem in the Catholics. He, he can't assume and he can't desire fame and fortune. And so he has to go moonlight as a wrestler. He meets a tag team partner named Stephen. And he and Stephen get together and he says this little phrase to Stephen. It's a fantastic film. You do need to see it. Aren't you tired of getting dirt kicked in your face? Don't you want to taste the glory and see what it's like? And to be honest with you, after I've seen it a few times, I, I've stopped and I've thought about that phrase. Don't we want to see the glory of God and taste what it's like? I mean, all of us, every single one of us ought to desire in the light, in the taste of the glory of Jesus Christ. Now, let me just give you a spoiler alert. He does go on him and Stephen, and they win the championship, and they provide tons of meals and food to the orphans, and he even falls in love with a beautiful nun. How about that? But I stand before you today and invite you to the book of Acts, chapter 20. In, in Acts chapter 20, you have the Apostle Paul who has tasted and seen the desire and delight in the glory of Jesus. And he in this moment is speaking for the final time to the leaders of Ephesus. He's on his third missionary journey. He spent three months preaching to them in the synagogue, daily trying to just win them over to the things of God. He, in this last moment, it's an emotional, personal scene, is pouring out to his heart to folks that he may never see again as he speaks to the next generation leaders. These are the hallmarks of his ministry that he wants to pass on. And so whether you're a seasoned professor today or whether you are a seminary student, if we could just re-engineer our lives this morning, and say, these are going to be the hallmark of my ministry because they were the hallmark of the Apostle Paul's ministry that he desired to pass down to the next generation. In Acts chapter 20, from the hand of Dr. Luke, we find these words beginning with verse 17. We find ourselves in Miletus, and I'm reading for, from the Christian Standard Bible because I'm a good Southern Baptist boy. How about that? From the CSB, the Word of God tells us this. Verse 17, Acts 20 and following. The Word of God tells us now from Miletus. He sent to the Ephesus and summoned the elders of the church. When they came to him, he said to them, You know from the first day I set foot in Asia how I was serving with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility, tears, enduring trials that came to me through the plots of the Jews. Verse 20 says, 
you know that I did not avoid proclaiming to you anything that was profitable from teaching you publicly and from house to house. I testified to both Jews and Greeks about repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus. And now I am on my way to Jerusalem, compelled by the Spirit, not knowing what I will encounter there, except that in every town, the Holy Spirit warns me that the chains and afflictions are awaiting me. Verse 24, but I consider my life of no value to myself. My purpose is to finish my course. The ministry I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of God's grace. Friends, if you were to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you would say that is the chapter of love. That is love in doctrine. As we read Acts chapter 20, what you find is love in action. And I want you to see very quickly as we work through our text together in verse 17, we are in Miletus. He's moved there due to persecution. He sent for the the leaders of Ephesus. He summoned them together. They come, and when they came to him, he says to them, you know from the first day I set foot in Asia how I was with you the whole time. One of the greatest leadership lessons I've ever learned is monkey see, monkey do. Have you learned that? In Acts chapter 1, verse 1, Dr. Luke tells us, you've seen Jesus do these things. You follow the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our example. And friends, we truly have an example here from the Apostle Paul, and so he tells us very clearly what we ought to do. If you're taking pens, you pull out your highlighter, mascara, pen, pencil, whatever you got, and you write down these things because he begins with an upward movement to God. He begins with his ministry and service to God. Understand this, friend, that God has called you into this ministry, not for ministry, but for intimacy. He's called you into this that you would grow in your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And what he tells us right here is that he is a servant of the Lord, that he is a doulos, that he is a bondservant, that he is a slave to God. Oh, friends, our churches, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is not a democracy. It is not a church of the people and for the people. No, 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 no. It's a kingdom with a king. And we are his servants. Our task is to be obedient. Our call this morning is to be a servant to the master. Whatever he says goes. We follow his orders because we are doulos. We are bondservants of Christ. But we're bondservants. We're slaves Now look at these attributes. We're slaves of the Lord. We're servants of God with humility. We know the Scriptures tell us that God gives grace to the humble and He opposes the proud. But we like our leaders strong and proud and never willing to apologize. One of the hallmarks that God is looking for us as Christ followers is humility. Would you agree that pride is like bad breath? Everybody knows that you got it but you. (laughs) When I became president of Georgia Baptist Convention, I said, Dr. Jerry Vines, he's a dear mentor of mine, I said, I'm president of the Georgia Baptist Convention. It's amazing God take a a trailer park kid and just bring me to this place. He said, son, he's got that long draw of southerner. He said, you can smell the cologne, but don't drink it. It'll kill you. Hey, some of you are going to do some wonderful things for King Jesus. Can I beg of you today? Always remain humble before him. Have humility. Don't always seek the seat of honor. As Luke 14 tells us, would you sit in a proper content and just be content where you are, where God has put you, and be faithful there and allow God to move in ways in your life where you don't have to seek after it? One of the hallmarks that we ought to seek for in our Southern Baptist Convention is humility. Crawford Loritz says it better than anybody else. Listen to how he defines humility. Humility is the intentional recognition that God is everything to you, and that you are nothing without Him. It is the acknowledgement that life is not about 
you. And the needs of others are more important than your own. That's humility. He says we serve the Lord with humility, but also with tears. You're going to get one of the finest educations right here at Gateway, and I believe that with all of my heart. I was in a situation where Dr. Brad Witt said, I'll send you to any seminary in the country. I want to invest in you, Josh. I chose Gateway Seminary because of the leadership that is here, because of the community that's built around here. You're going to receive one of the best educations. Let your brain be filled with wonderful biblical knowledge. But get this right here from this text, that it was filled with tears in this passage as well. If you look at verse 36, 37, and 38, and after he said these, they knelt down, they prayed with them. There were many tears. They were shed by everybody. They embraced Paul. They kissed him, grieving over the fact that they would never see his face again. What that tells us is, yes, he taught them the gospel the wonderful counsel of God. We see that in verse 27. But friends, they also loved him. You be a minister. You be a follower of Christ that's invested into others as well. That tells me not only did he exegete the word of God well to them, he knew his flock as well. He knew their names. He knew them. I think one of the craziest things is that we can exegete the scriptures so well, but we don't know our people's names. Love them well. Know the flock. Walk with them and shepherd them. It's the greatest joy of my life. I have one of the greatest people that I have the the privilege of serving. And I call them on their birthdays and their anniversaries and key milestones. I pray for five families every day. I want to know our people well. It's one of the greatest joys of my wife and I's lives. And friends, if you were to tell us today, we'd never see those people again. I resonate with the Apostle Paul. It would, make, it would break our hearts because we love them so much. Love your people well. Love this community that you're in well. He says, with humility, we serve the Lord. But also in tears. This was an emotional experience. But did you see what it says as well? He says, with trials. The, the trials come along. The trials will come. They come through the plots of the Jews. Would you agree with me that the Apostle Paul probably saw more trials than any other Christ follower? I mean, he was shipwrecked. He was abandoned. He was beaten. Man, he was even snake bitten. The only good snake is a dead snake. Amen. I mean, he had been around the block. He had seen suffering come his way. But you know what I don't ever read, Dr. Orge, of Apostle Paul's life is a burnout. Uh, Please understand, I work with pastors all over the place. I get it. Burnout is a real thing. It is. But friends, we don't ever read of that. And he experienced a lot of suffering. And and I think the answer to that is in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16, 17, and 18. He says, the outer man is perishing, but the inner man is being renewed day by day. Today is the only day we've got with King Jesus. Invest in today to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. We can't live off yesterday's manna. We've sung about that earlier already. First song. You can't live off yesterday's manna. you got today to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. Tomorrow has enough worries of its own. Today, friends, we strengthen ourselves through the word and through song that we can go out of this place being greater followers of Christ in the midst of suffering and trials and tribulations. Here the Apostle Paul tells us it's day by day through those trials, at least according to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. You see, he, he, he gives us this upward movement and this last hurrah to these leaders. The next generation you give yourself to God as a slave, as a bondservant, through tears, suffering, and humility. But look what he says to the church. Look at his ministry now. And note these. You know that I did not avoid proclaiming to you anything that was profitable from teaching you publicly and from house to house. I proclaim the word of God to you publicly and house to house. Verse 27, he said, I did not avoid declaring to you the whole plan of God. Friends, in our calling to the church, let us be faithful to the task of proclaiming the Word of God publicly and also privately. Let's do it in our homes, and let's do it from our pulpits. 
How can we, a good conscience, ask our church to be people of prayer if the Sefco household isn't a household of prayer? Let's proclaim it in our houses as well. Because you know this, these are troubling days. These are trying days. In the midst of persecution, as the, Paul, as the Apostle Paul found himself in, he says to him, I will proclaim what is profitable to you. Now, what is profitable? All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, rebuking, and correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. That's our calling right there. That's our, that's our task right there that we would teach the Word of God, even in the midst of trials. And friends, in South Atlanta, Georgia, we have our own set of trials. You know, if you ever want to really test a community, join the local public school system's curriculum study of sexual ed, health, and PE, and speak into it as a pastor. And you'll poke the bear of sexual immorality in your community. And, you know, we don't get to choose the platforms in which we're called. I just stepped into a place of obedience of an open door, and God uses those platforms for us to be obedient in. I didn't get to choose that. I just stepped in, and friends, I had to be faithful. Just a few months ago, our county said that we couldn't do a car show because we were agriculturally zoned. And they tried to shut down a car show. Me and Rick Ross, the rapper in our community, got linked up, joined arms. How about that? The pastor and the rapper linked arms. And the reason I say all this, friends, is because I also got letters from our church family saying, would you please just stop talking about Jesus? We have saved. Move on. See, we don't ever get over the gospel. We grow deeper in it, don't we? Uh, what I'm saying is I had someone write me a letter not long ago that would say, uh, can, if you don't sing our types of music, we're going to quit our giving. And I stood before the church and said, I won't be manipulated. We're going to sing Christ-exalting worship. That's what we're about. We're not choosing music based off of preference. Uh, why am I telling you all that? Because we preach the Word of God in season and out of season. We preach the Word of God knowing that it's profitable to all who hear when it's cool and when it's not, when your collar is popped and when it is not. And my point being is this. When they applaud you, you preach the Word. When they attack you, you preach wild bloody. When you are uh, abused, you keep preaching. When they abandon you, you preach alone. Above all, beloved, you keep preaching the Word of of God. Why? Because there are souls in balance. Why? Because time is short. Friends, I submit to you today, if you are called, get to work and preach the beautiful gospel of Jesus and the whole counsel of God. That was his task. Proclaiming what is profitable in public and in private. Look what he says next. And go from house to house, I testified to the Jews and the Greeks. Jews and Greeks, it's good for all, for every tribe, every tongue. It's good for every race. Isn't that what Acts chapter 1 verse 8 tells us? Our Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth, that we are to go and tell all to every nation and every tribe and every tongue. So can I just, can I just put this before you? That, that Jerusalem... Is your home first, too. There's some of you who are burdened for your children. You go and you proclaim to your family. But for, for those of us, it's that Judea and Samaria, we're to cross cultural boundaries as well. And maybe this is just from my own context and what it means so dearly to me that we're to win every Caucasian person to Jesus, that we are to win every African American to, to Jesus, that we are to win every Hispanic to Jesus, that we are to win everybody we possibly can to Christ Jesus. Aren't we just launching a new evangelistic theme here? The evangelism project? It ought to be our task as every Christ follower to go and tell to the Jew and to the Greek, and certainly you see that played out in Paul's life. But look what it says next. With repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus. 
Repentance isn't a word we use much anymore. But I submit to you, it's one of the greatest words in all of the New Testament. It's one of the greatest gifts to the, nun, the, un, the unbeliever and to the believer. One that can make you right with God. It is a great word that we ought to use often in our own language before God. That we come with repentance. In, in Luke, he's, Jesus' first message is about repentance. In, in Luke, at the, at the end of the gospel, Luke, Jesus' last message is about repentance. John the Baptist's words were about repentance. Preacher, can I ask you, when's the last time you used the word repent and believe? We talk a lot about faith. And we should. We take up the shield of faith, every one of us. It, we have one faith unto all believers. Once unto all, Jude says. It is the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I submit to you today, let it be with rep repentance and with faith to the Jew and to the Greek, proclaiming the beautiful message of God in your house and in the church house. Look what he says next in verse 22. And now I am on my way to Jerusalem, compelled by the Spirit. Compelled by the Spirit, not knowing what I will encounter there. For some of you type A's, this is already giving you heartburn, just reading over this passage. I love it because he doesn't know where. He knows there's affliction coming. And it reminds you of Abraham. He didn't know where. God just said, get up and go. Be faithful to where he's called you. Sometimes we're not going to know exactly where. You develop that right here, right now. But can I just give you this word? Many of us pray that God will open a door, open a door. God, I'm looking for clarity. I'm looking for clarity. I'm looking for clarity. But if you're not careful, clarity can end up being the idol in your life. And what he's asking for you to do is trust him. And God may never give you that clarity. He may just start to unfold a little bit at a time. And you just need to trust him each and every step of the way. Being led by the spirit of God through his word but what he seeks and desires from us is trust. That you would trust him. That you acknowledge him in all of his ways. And he'll direct your paths. Is the Apostle Paul not sure what he's going to encounter there? Except in every town, the Holy Spirit warns him that chains and afflictions are awaiting him there. And then we land on our final verse in verse 24. He says, but I consider myself, my life of no value, my purpose is to finish my course, the ministry that I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of God's grace. We don't see a lot of self-preservation there in Paul's words. A lot of times that's what we seek first in 21st century America. Paul says, I gave myself over to every, every affliction. Every, I consider my life no value to myself, but my purpose is to finish the course, the ministry in which I have received from the Lord Jesus Christ. Can, can we do this today on August 31st? Can you make a commitment to God today that you would finish strong? Please, I'm standing before you today as a next generation saying to those of you who are finishing, finish Strong. There is a generation watching man and woman again and again fall and not finish strong. I'm standing here today. Finish the course well for Jesus. For those of you who are coming up through the ranks, would you commit today that I will be faithful all the way to the end and I will finish my course that the ministry the Lord's entrusted to me with a faithful endurance until I see King Jesus face to face. I agree with Paul. I want to press on towards the mark of Christ Jesus. I agree with the Apostle Paul. I want to pour myself out as a drink offering already. I want to fight the good fight. I want to stay the course all the way to the end. Will you join me in that? Professor, will you join me in that? Student today, will you join me in that? Let's make a commitment, draw a line, and put it before the Lord this morning that we will finish our course well for King Jesus. 
Friends, this is his last word. Last words really ought to be lasting words. And I ask you to do this today. What do you want the last paragraph of your life to be about? Would you write down some hallmarks maybe you've seen here today through the Apostle Paul's life? And would you take those and you write down that last paragraph of what you want your life to be about? And would you pass it on to someone else? Would you pour your heart on a page? And would you give it to someone that you love with all of your heart? Someone that you cherish deeply. And you let them know that this is what your life has been all about. And testify of the glorious gospel of God's grace. Let's have a glorious finish together. May I pray for us?